Well, welcome back to The Honest Pod. I'm super excited because I am going to have a co-host for the next three weeks, which Let's is going to be go. awesome. I know it's going to be awesome because <laughs> I had a co-host way back when. For those of you that are OG Honest Pod peeps, my sister and I posted hosted this thing together and now I've kind of been on my own, which has been great, but it's going to be so fun to have Miss Tori Hine be my co-host for the next week. Tori Hello, Hine, everybody. To the podcast. What an honor. What you an actually, honor. You're not a stranger. You've been on here. We actually had you on and it was such a good episode and we talked so long. It actually ended up being two episodes. Yes. <laughs> which feels on brand. On but, brand. That's yes. on brand. That's Jinx. right. That's right. And so I, one of the things that we were talking about, Tori actually works for Freedom Movement. We are, we work together to help just really enhance helping people heal in their story, embrace their story through a biblically sound trauma-informed and spirit-filled lens. And we pulled Tori on because honestly, we're going to all be real clear, real honest about the lane that I run in. It is not through systems, operations, strategy, marketing, all of those, <laughs> hate them all. I am not, that's <laughs> not who I am. And for, and this is crazy guys, for three years, now it's been four years, to be honest with you, four years I've been praying, God, I need you to bring in somebody, I call them queenly, someone, and you guys have heard me talk about this before when I've interviewed other people that have queen-like aspects and they like the queen is the woman or the, or the king that, that takes, can, sees the land and is like, here, I want to create systems and structure to keep the land safe, protected, and moving forward. That is not who I am. Although God has put me in that role for a really long time, it's not totally who I am. I am much more of a prophetic nature of this is where I think God is leading us. I'm much more of like calling out the injustices in the hearts. Although, Tori, you do a mm -hmm. lot of that as well. Uh, there is something about you that brings structure and brings vision with uh, like legs to it to be Grounding. able to go, Hey, this is, yeah, this is mm. how we're going to get from, from A to B. And I am so thankful. So we've pulled you on. It's almost been a year, which is wild. It's almost been a year. It's been a fun year. I've learned a lot. It's been a yeah, very creative. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you didn't know you were signing up to build a website, but here we are. <laughs> <laughs> that is the one piece of the puzzle that I'm like, guys, I've done this once. This is not my lane. This but, is never again. Yeah, it's a good puzzle. Good puzzle to learn, I guess. Yeah, you <laughs> did figure it out. And I'm very for eternally grateful for that. That well, mostly because I didn't have to do it. So there's that. Yeah, that's uh, all right. It's so my labor of love. To, it's my offering. That's that's right. It truly was. That's it, though. We're done. Sacrifice is over. <laughs> one and done website. <laughs> That's right. You guys can go check that out at wearefm.org. Nice little plug Let's there. Let's go. Actually, it's, it's really cool. The website's really good. You did a very good job on it. Okay. So Thank you. the reason why we wanted to pull you on, one, I just want the people to get to know you better because you have become such a staple in freedom movement and in my life, but two, because you and I are putting on a conference, a one-day conference on Saturday, July 29th. I got it mm -hmm. right. So reclaim your yes. story. Yeah. Reclaim your story. We were talking about this because I think for many of you guys out there, because of what we've heard, you get the concept that there is a better story for you there, that God has goodness for you, abundance for you. He has a story that wants to uh, be aligned with him, that wants to be integrated. And you hear all these things, but I think a lot of times we get kind of bogged down with how do we begin to reclaim the story in certain areas of our life? Because we are not just one story. We are many parts, right? Mind, body, and heart, spirit. And so in these areas, we're kind of looking at going, gosh, I, you know, you've read the book, maybe you haven't, go get it, Free and Fully Alive. And it talks a lot about this idea around connection to self, God, and others. It gives you some how, but we wanted to get really like in the weeds about some <laughs> things that I just touch on in the book. But really what we're going to kind of highlight and go even more in depth on July 29th. And so we, we started a series, we're going to start a series here called Reclaiming the Story, which is the same title of the conference that we're doing, but Reclaim the Story. And we're going to do it in three particular areas. And today we want to talk about reclaiming the story in your body. 
which I was really mm-hmm. excited to talk about because it's been the hardest place for me. This has been like the hardest place for me to really reclaim ground there and really like really understanding what that means. And we were talking before we got on and we were talking about silly things, but truly like, you know, reclaiming the body with, with food, reclaiming your body, you know, when it comes to like grounding meditation, reclaiming your nervous system, like all of these things. But one of the things we were talking about before we got on was how I am, I am taking care of four teenage boys right now. Okay. And they are, Lord help her. Yeah, they have two of my own, 18 and 16, and then their cousins came to visit 18 and 16. And within this week alone, we've gone to Sam's Club, <laughs> we have spent $450, we have gone through three gallons of milk, five pounds of chicken three tenders. Three gallons of milk. <laughs> five <laughs> pounds of chicken tenders. I mean, it's, it's that's just alarming. That's so many chicken tenders. These so boys amazing. need to be brought to a farm and learn how to pluck their own chickens, pull those feathers out, you know. They need we to need start working for this stuff. Yeah, you need a I'm homestead. <laughs> I, and I just thought about how, how in tune with my boys are with their hunger and with their need for food. It is like... I remember Ryder looking at me, my oldest, and I was like, Ryder, you cannot possibly be hungry again. You just ate. And he looked at me deadpan in the face and he said, mom, I'm starving. And I was like, (laughs) how how can you be? And he was in all sincerity. Like I am ravenous. And I was like, all right. And so now I just buy a, a four pound bag of French fries and we're almost through that whole thing. I mean, it's just insane how much we're eating them and i love what you said (laughs) it's like it's like the story it's like that song in beauty and the beast about gaston when he says when i was a lad i ate four dozen eggs every morning to help me get lard and now that i'm grown i eat five dozen eggs so i'm roughly the size of a bird (laughs) you're like living that. that Everybody in their car right now is like, I'm going to need to turn this down a little bit. Like, oh my gosh, who's this yeah. ghost? Get her out of here. No, they're pretty used to it. They're like, oh, this feels like this. Literally again, everything in life I can bring back to some sort of song from my theater days or, you know, a SpongeBob reference or any Disney movie. Usually right. it kind of shows my age. Right. Well, <laughs> and I my sense I of humor, too, what I thought was you. funny. but it is so funny so I the reason why I bring this up is because I was literally thinking about how when like for me food is I have such issues with food like I just really Mm -hmm. I am not an intuitive eater I've not I was not raised to be an intuitive eater I am very disconnected from and it's taken me years and years and years to be able to get reconnected to, to my body and to really mm-hmm. like, even down to the simple fact of, am I eating because I'm hungry or am I eating for some other reason? Is food a place of delight for me or is it a place of bondage? And if I'm being really honest, food has always been a soother for me when I'm feeling mm-hmm. stressed or it has been a place really of bondage because the food ultimately is then dictating the size of my pants. And so I have really had this war with that. But here I look at my boys, all these boys in my home who are all very fit. Like no one is struggling with, you know, body stuff. Praise the Lord. We broke that generation of curse with my children. But, and they're all intuitive eaters. Like they will eat junk food and even my daughter will leave half of a donut. Like she's just like, Mm -hmm. I'm done. And she just leaves it. And I think this is this is insanity. I could never mm-hmm. leave half of a donut. I, I, I will eat the whole thing if it's in front of me, which just made me mm. realize how much, how deep this goes when it comes to, and how much more it is not about food as it is about so much of deeper layers of places in my body. And in so many of mm-hmm. us who are listening where there's just so much more rooted issue going on than just, oh, I feel like eating, you know, a dozen donuts, you know, whatever. I can't stop. Like, there's just so much more going on. So we thought this would be so powerful 
to go, what, what does it look like to reclaim the story in our body? And I want to start with just the basics of what we believe here, what we believe is doctrinally true, what we believe is, you know, just absolutely God's intention. And that is that God created us with intention, not just because he was creating and there was activity that he just was like, okay, I'm going to create this. I'm going to create this. Okay. I'm going to create this. But there was real intention. And that intention was not just our, we're going to create, but there was a line in scripture in Genesis 1 31, I think, or 20 something. Anyway, you can find it. It's Genesis one, uh, where God says, we are going to make man in our image which that in our image piece shows us that there is intention for creation, there is intention for communion, and there is intention for reflection. And it is in those places that we begin to understand, first and foremost, we call these our Ur stories. So Ur is like the beginning, the ground, where we came from. If you want to know who you are and where you came from, read the first five books of the Bible, and you will understand right. humanity. And so mm -hmm. when we look at that, the very beginning of intention, God says at the end, that's Genesis 131, where he says, it is all very good. This mm -hmm. is the intention. And yet we have gone astray, right? The body yeah. has not been viewed as good. And we were talking a little bit, um, Tori, and, and would love to hear your thoughts about this, but you had said, uh, as we were talking, just how much really in the church we did mm -hmm. not hear about our bodies being good. In fact, I think we kind of felt, we kind of heard the counter of that. And I'd love for you yeah. to just, you know, talk a little bit about just your thoughts about that. I know you had brought that up earlier and I thought what you had to say and just in relation to some of that was just really yeah, profound. Absolutely. It's really interesting because when you, like you said, when you're reading the first few books of the Bible and you're getting the foundational understanding biblically of who we are, who God is, how he cares for us. Even when you're reading through a book like Leviticus that speaks, m the majority of those laws are speaking to the treatment of the human body, mm -hmm. um, sexually, what you're eating, what you're not eating, what is clean, what is unclean, what it looks like to live set apart, holy lives that honor and encounter God with these gifts of our human bodies like the most magnificent, beautiful gift, the only thing that has the capacity of love and our bodies have the capacity of justice and truth and creativity and we reproduce and we design and our hands create art and our souls, like just looking into another person's eyes as they're crying brings something alive in us. Like we are in every sense, fearfully and wonderfully made by God. And mm. as we talk about in, uh, in all of the work in freedom movement, wherever the enemy comes to steal and kill and destroy, is an area for us personally and intimately specifically um, that can highlight our God-given calling. But when you see patterns of how the enemy has come to steal and kill and destroy the goodness of God, the original design of things, um, then you see a pattern throughout all of history where the enemy is keeping us from a place of intimacy and connection with God and mm. hands down, there has been an assignment against the human body from the garden to today. Yes. Um, and there will be for forever. And when mm -hmm. you look through, um, you know, the history, church history, there's uh, seasons in church history where the body is so, that is such a center point and a focus. And then there were other seasons where uh, abusive powers and, um, you know, different, you know, church twists and turns in the historical timeline led people to completely forsake their bodies and detach my, their human body from the focus of their spirit or the focus mm -hmm. of knowledge. Um, 
And in the post-enlightenment era where you have like the reformation, all of a sudden there is this redemption of the human body because the first time in all of history, you have copies of the Bible in regular human hands where they're Mm -hmm. reading versus like what you just read and understanding, oh my gosh, I'm encountering something glorious every time Mm -hmm. that I I look in the reflection of, um, you know, of a mirror And you almost see too much of an, you know, an elevated viewpoint of the human body as something that is, it's being worshiped. And now we're living in this time where we wake up in the morning and we go to sleep at night, having looked at thousands of images of somebody else's bodies on the internet. Right. And we're living in a church where we don't really know how to engage this conversation um, well. Instead, Mm -hmm. we focus on sin issues, we focus on, you know, the spiritual growth, we focus on heaven, and yet we are abusing or neglecting or dismissing or ignoring the very place, our human bodies, where we encounter the presence of God and where the presence of God dwells in us. Mm. And so... You know, when we were putting together the notes for these meetings, Carrie and I both were talking about how the body was almost the last thing to be engaged in our Mm -hmm. own healing journeys. And we're we're learning to navigate this and it goes so much deeper than what you're putting into your mouth. Like that is, it's the easiest place to begin because I haven't met a woman who hasn't at least had maybe a period of time where food has been an idol or, or an addiction or a place of numbing. And there hasn't been a wrestle, which is, I think why it's important to talk about this. Mm. Um, you know, but we're, we're encountering a new level of freedom when it becomes embodied and it's no longer just information that we're learning or a Bible study that we're meeting our friends with on a, on a Wednesday night, but when worship invades every element of our human existence and Mm -hmm. our very honor for the design and the limitations and the goodness of our human bodies is in and of itself worship and allows us to love God and love each other on a much more deeper level because it's an embodied experience rather than just a knowledge experience. Right. And here's the thing, like you, you hear all the things that you're saying and really like how we've gotten to where we've gotten, you know, even in history of looking through, you know, the Saxons and looking through really like how much England and Rome affected England. And there was all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. As I look at all of that history, I see so much of Christianity being based on, and this was even in Judaism as well through so much fear and regulation around the body. And we're either going to give over to our pleasures. If we engage the body too much, we give over to our pleasures and we're just, you know, sexual beasts. Or we we beat the body into submission um, so that we don't give over to anything that is counterfeit. And all of it has created, we are the descendants of this cultural narrative. Like we didn't just wake up one day and have this issue with our body. This has been a long lasting struggle around even the law. You know, when God, when Jesus came to abolish the law, it, it was, there is freedom now, but that freedom without submission and surrender under God moves itself into sin. It, it moves itself into, you know, crazy right. places. So because uh, my point being is when we don't understand something, we are actually bound by it. So we have to begin mm-hmm. to understand the body, why, you know, why it's, how do we engage it kind of what it's doing now? Obviously we can't unpack all of that in this podcast, but I want you to begin to understand from the garden to where we are today is that when she ate of the food, that was when Eve ate of the food, this was a bodily moment that that something was ingested. It was the ingesting of something that she was forbidden to eat because it wasn't going to be good for her. 
think about this. This wasn't done unto her body. This was done in her body. This was a food that was taken into her body that began to shift the DNA structure of who she was and who she was created to be. In that moment, that ingesting shifted things. So what we ingest, not just food, but what we ingest, you know, through thoughts, through what we put into our body does have neurological effects to how we see God and each other and ourselves. And this is why Jesus, when he goes into the garden to look for them, starts to engage with them. Not He knows everything. He knows what's happened. He knows all that's happened. But he wants to try to restore intimacy, even though the DNA, like there has been a change in the genetic makeup of, of Adam and Eve now. And he wants right. to do, now he's like, well, we, we can't go back to what you were. <laughs> that's that you're changed now. But what I can do is begin to engage with the places where there's been wounding now and engage that with kindness and care. There is consequences to the things that we ingest and put into our body. Think, breathe, smell, touch, whatever. So there was consequences to that, but there was engagement of the wounds and the places, even though there was neurological change and that and, and genetic, really genetic change. And so mm-hmm. that is one day we will be restored and that is going, we will be back to the original design of our bodies. So right. when we look at the yeah. idea around reclaiming our body and really where the church uh, kind of just kind of falls off is truly because one, I think they're the product of religion that has been passed down, especially Anglo-Saxon religion, which is very, very, you know, uh, strong, high, uh, high disregard for the body that the body is a is a fleshly evil thing mm-hmm. that's going to lead you to temptation we are products of that and so the yeah. church doesn't talk about this because i don't think they understand it no. and so because yeah. they don't understand it we're bound to it right and so right. i would love to just kind of break down a little bit around um kind of the counterfeit of where our bodies go and what that potentially looks like both just scientifically and practically, and then really mm-hmm. break down what it means to reclaim. But as I'm kind of talking, Tori, I, I'm curious, what's coming up for you? Because I know I know you well enough to know that your brain just kind of <laughs> spins and spins and spins. But this yeah. is a big this is a big topic for you. It's a big this topic. Is an, yeah, yeah, this is an area that you have felt very that you feel very passionate about, and would be curious about, like, kind of what's coming up for you as we're talking right now. Absolutely. I mean, on a practical level, when we're talking about food, for example, because the last decade of my life has been, um, I've had a side job, if not a full-time job in the health and wellness industry. And people would come to me as a health coach, um, wanting a nutrition plan, but really needing care for their story. Um, Thinking if I could just change something external about my body, then I will feel and secure love and joy Mm -hmm. and belonging and purpose and worth. Maybe my husband would stay. Maybe I'd get that job. Maybe my children will come back. Maybe they'll love me again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll love me again, or maybe for the first time. And, um, it didn't take me long to realize that this was happening, but then on the same, <laughs> the same token, it's like, I get paid as long as you get results. <laughs> and mm-hmm. it was, um, it was interesting because 80, if not 90% of the actual transformation that they needed had nothing to do with the food that was being put into their mouth, but everything about, um, the love that needed to be reestablished by God in their story. When you're bringing up, Um, the garden where uh, Eve chooses to become one with her idea um, and her breakdown of goodness, which is really what it came down to. The enemy presented Uh her with an alternative form of goodness, wisdom, you know, the desires of her heart. She had to become one with that. You, you eat something and it becomes 
in you, integrated yes. in you. And it actually is then transferred into energy that becomes your very flesh and blood stored in your body or yes. converted into energy that it's used to, li to live. So essentially what she was doing was saying, the way that God has designed me to live in unity with him is not enough. I need a different form of goodness that hinges on my ability to discern and understand and to fix and to change and to control. I'm going to become one with that. And then um, thus began the redemption story, which we'll talk about at the very end of the podcast about what it looks like to reclaim your story. But to just give you a little glimmer of hope in this is that then you fast forward to the communion table with Jesus and his disciples. And he says, you must eat my body. You mm -hmm. must become one with my blood, not physically saying you're going to drink my flesh and eat my blood, but it means you're going to need to become one with the redemption that I am purchasing for you with my body. Take and eat. And all of a sudden you see this whole you know, oh, flashback to the garden, to this new garden where Jesus is sweating blood and laying himself before the father and going, okay, use me. And now we have entry. We have an opportunity an open door through Jesus to now eat something new ooh, on a practical ooh. level. When it comes to food, I just, I want, I always say, Carrie is the one that goes like into the deep, dark trenches of topics like this. And I'm willing to follow her there. But then I'm usually like the, okay, let's give them a little practical application, you know, for right. how to like live this out on a, on a right. practical level and like do this. Um, in my, um, in my health coaching, I learned that there's four types of eating. So there's eating for fuel, which is really what we should be doing about 80% of the time, nourishing our body with diverse different types of food groups and protein and fat and carbohydrates, foods, food that grows, food that is designed by God. Okay. Um, the second form of eating is eating for joy, which you see throughout all of scripture as well. The gathering of people, pouring a glass of wine, enjoying that cup of coffee cool. in the morning, enjoying like honey is good, it says in Proverbs, like, but yes. just don't have too much of it, you know? <laughs> Um, and then there's two other types of eating that we're looking to completely avoid. And these are the types of eating that reflect a deeper issue of the heart that goes way deeper than just the hunger of your belly. The first form of eating is storm eating. This is when you're, in, you're experiencing extreme emotional turmoil. And it's mm -hmm. like you need something very specific. You need for me, this actually happened almost every single last day of the month when I was um, in sales because the last day of the month is your sale month. You yeah. are up at you 6 a.m. Yep. You got to crush it. You got it. So I would forsake my body all day long, wouldn't eat anything, wouldn't nourish my body or take care of myself throughout that day. I would wake up in the morning and from 6 a.m. until 6 p.m. it was constant messaging people, reminding people, put your order in before the end of midnight. And then you would be up until midnight with your team going back and forth about, did you get your goals in? Did you get your things in? And about 10 PM every single time that this last day of the month would happen, I would become ravenously needy for Oreos. <laughs> Specifically, it was always Oreos and it was always wine. And it because was always, delicious. you know, something else along those lines, potato chips or whatever, I would become ravenous. This is the storm eating. Mm -hmm. And this was coming from this place of needing to prove my worth and the looking down the barrel of the goals for that month and how hard you had worked and whatever. And it would, it would fuel this need to numb and it would be the mm -hmm. storm eating. And mm -hmm. then, um, the fourth form of of eating is called, um, they call it like ghost eating or, um, it's when you're basically just eating because things are around you. If there's a plate of food there, then you have to eat it. If you're mm -hmm. bored, you're, you know, rummaging into, um, the pantry to find a snack and, and whatnot. And, um, so you're constantly grazing and eating and that's called ghost eating. Um, where you're not physically engaged with the needs of your body, but you're just grabbing for food. 
And this right. is usually when I would be disengaged from the needs of my body in not a like hyper-regulated sense in the nervous system where I'm like, I'm all over the place, but it's more like a hypo-regulation outside my window of tolerance where I'm numbing myself with mm -hmm. food. So for both of this storm eating and ghost eating, this is when we have an invitation of curiosity and compassion when these sort of things come up, because we, we have people that come for, to our freedom movement, you know, trainings that are looking to resolve behaviors. That's, those are usually the two that they're like, help me fix sure. this. Right. And, um, in f it, there's no fixing this without going into the depths of your story of the reasons why you are disengaged from your body or you are, you know, abusing and overworking your body to a place where your body then goes, it's time to reestablish safety. And you know how we're going to do it? Through food, because you've been designed to eat food. So I want to I want to pass it back over to you, Carrie, because one of the things that you were just talking about was how we adapt to create that safety in our story. Mm -hmm. And then after a while, our bodies, the good design of our bodies, that God gave us, that designed us to keep us safe, to keep mm -hmm. us protective, then become maladaptive. Mm -hmm. um, will you speak to that and talk about how those patterns kind of shift and change and mm -hmm. what it's it looks so cool like to, to hear grow? Practically, how you are, you know, with the idea of food, and I'm going to use the idea to with that um, for me in regards to emotions, and yeah. you know, like depression being a very you know, it's a kind of a buzzword and it's really, I hated depression forever because I didn't understand it. I thought about it as being a place because this is definitely what, where my body goes when it is, when it is dysregulated, when it's in sin, when it like, mm. for many reasons, my go-to place is apathy and, and depression. I can get really anxious. Definitely have had panic attacks and kind of swing the pendulum of both of those. But I think for the most part, I'm wired more to get to be depressed and to kind of just mm -hmm. be in a place. And depression is where um, the word depression is really this idea of being pressed down on. Like you just feel like you can't get up. Like you just feel like there's a weight yeah. on you. And I think about uh, that. And for the many years uh, that, that I struggled with that and, and still have tendencies towards that was really the outcome of, of so many things that were off in my home. And I didn't know at a young age how to deal with them. And because I didn't know how to deal with them, there was a way of like the body finding its best way to try to be able to mitigate, to manage, to adapt to the pain that was happening in my home. Depression yeah. was actually a way for my body to shut down a little bit so that it didn't have to feel the weight, the, the, the greater weight of what was going on around me. I was able mm -hmm. to take the weight on me. Think about this in the terms of the garden. Here where Adam and Eve, they eat of this tree, they know something is, now they look at their body, then it says, and now they notice their shame. They have shame. There's something going on. And so they try as best as they can to adapt to their surroundings so that they don't have to experience the full weight of their shame. And so they cover themselves. This is an adaptive behavior that they do to try to mitigate the sin and the shame that they're experiencing. This is why Jesus goes after them, begins to ask them questions, because the only way out of adaptive behaviors that are keeping us from true intimacy is connection with Jesus and, and being honest about where we've come. I say all of that because the body will always try and find ways to be able to handle what feels unmanageable. And it will find ways, especially when you are young, to adapt to your surroundings to be able to go, okay, I don't know how to deal with the fact that my parents just got divorced, but I know, I know when I eat ding-dongs, uh, that actually in a moment, if we're being quite, makes me feel good. It makes me yeah. feel soothed. 
So Absolutely. when I, when I have a mom who is distant, she's up in her room, she's not engaging us. She's not nurturing us. And I'm angry about that. And I have a father who's going into ministry and, and forsaking at that time, his family. And I'm angry at that. My body goes, this is too much to feel. And we don't have anyone to hold this for us. So depression is just really anger, anger turned inward. That's, that's really what it is. It's, right. a, it's a sense of not being able to name and understand your anger to be able to have it tended to like in the garden where Jesus says, Hey, what happened here? Let's have a dialogue about that. When you don't have places to have dialogue, you do adapt. The body will do adaptive behaviors to try to manage the pain. Okay. So I have a client that yeah. I was working with, been working with her for a really long time. She uh, is uh, and she would say this, she is morbidly obese. She is knows that if she does not get help, she's, she's going to die. She is uh, several hundred pounds. And I, I was working with her for a while. Food was her problem, but no one becomes 400 pounds because you just like to eat ding-dongs. That, that's not the case. That's right. As we pull back the layers, we begin to hear the stories of poverty of locks on cabinets because they were poor and they were afraid that she would eat too much of the food that Ugh. her father would name names to her. Like you are, you know, Omar, the tent maker. That's how big your dresses are. These, these comments mm. that were made that are excruciatingly painful. The very thing that she's being kept from is the the very thing that becomes her best friend. It's, the, it's yep. the food that becomes the place of soothing. For me to go inward with my emotions, uh, to, to sit and ruminate around how sad I am and how hard things are, although I don't like depression, in a way, it becomes a counterfeit salve yeah. to my broken heart. This right. grown up in, in our life, when we grow up, we carry those adaptive behaviors. We carry the anger that doesn't have a place to go. We carry mm -hmm. those numbing techniques. We carry the food, the, those adaptive, the people pleasing, the, okay, I'll just be more successful. The beating up mm. of our body and the way that it managed pain, we bring that into our adult life. And this is what, this is exactly what Tori just said. Those adaptive behaviors in our bodies that are bodily become maladaptive, meaning they no longer are serving us as adults. As kids, right. they served us in the way of keeping us protected because we were seven and we had no other option. We couldn't just like get up and leave. We had to live totally. in the home and live in the experience that we were in. And now yep. we're adults, but we have no idea how to engage our body. Last thing I'll say about this is I was talking with another client and she was saying how she's doing some work and stuff right now and how her body is just flaring up like crazy. It's just flaring mm -hmm. up all over the place. She's having pains in her back. Uh, another guy that I'm working with, he's like, I have chronic pain in my back and I've gone everywhere I can and I cannot figure out where it's coming from. And mm -hmm. as we peel back the layers we begin to talk and hear, and he begins to share about the sexual abuse that happened to him for <laughs> multiple years. And now he's talking about it. His body is starting to release and let yeah. out what it has been holding for so long. The body uh. will take matters into its own hands and it's a good body. So although depression, I hate it. It's always an indicator to me. Oh, I'm, I'm not, I am avoiding or not understanding that there are places inside me that are needing care right now. And, right. and, and that is coming in the form of either depression or tears or anger, especially because it's my body's <laughs> maladaptive way of having to be able to manage yes. in my, in its own kind of bodily way, because I've not allowed that invitation that happened in the garden to happen with me in a certain place mm. that I'm dealing with. Hey, Carrie, what's going on here? What did you do? What are you feeling? What are you thinking? What happened? Even though God where knows, are you? where are you? That invitation allows for God to be able to speak to the counterfeit of what I'm trying to cover up so I don't have to feel. Does that make sense what mm. I'm saying? 
Oh, it makes it makes a lot of sense. And I think the thing is, when then we're sitting in a church service and someone is giving you the list of the things that your life should look like, the way that your behavior should look like, the way that your diet could look, the way that your um, you know relationships should look, uh, when you're encountering a, a verse like, you know, perfect love casts out fear right. and, you know, cast all your anxieties on God because he cares for you and you shouldn't at all feel anxious or mm-hmm. fill in the blank of any feeling because you know, and you love Jesus. Mm-hmm. And although we know this is well-meaning and, and we're, you know, we're saying these things from a place of believing for freedom. And we believe that freedom is for every single human soul by the blood of Jesus Mm -hmm. that you see that it's so much deeper than just the action steps and behavior modification though. Mm -hmm. Because, um, when, when you look at studies, let's just talk about, um, you know, obesity, for example, and there are people who lose hundreds of pounds only to then gain it back because there was an underlining story of trauma that right. led them to doing that in the first place that actually kept them safe from danger. Mm-hmm. Each of these maladaptive um, behaviors are our own body's fleshly yes. response to create safety, yes. reestablish safety. So if you're a perfectionist and your issue is not overeating, but your issue is counting every single calorie that goes into your mouth um, and doing all of the right things um, Mm -hmm. so that you can have a body that physically is presented as being something that is good. I'm speaking to myself now. This is, Mm -hmm. this is Tori is Mm -hmm. that I would have these storm eating nights And then I would work out for three hours in the gym every day for the subsequent five days after that. Mm -hmm. And um, there was such a a gripping control over how my body was presented. I wanted to present myself as strong. I wanted to go to the pool and people see my rock solid abs and go, wow, what do you do? So that I could be a bulletin board to create more financial income for my health and wellness business so that I could create another layer of safety in my overworking um, and satiate that unstable, unsettled, you know, fear and anxiety. My, my response in my body was not do less or cave into yourself. My response was build that business, get to the gym, do the things And I live in a culture and was in a, you know, in a, like, even just community of people where the things that I was doing was not just encouraged, but praised Praised. and rewarded. Um, And so then I am, you know, my, my destructive behaviors are producing results that look externally good, but internally had like diseased root systems of fear and pain that was dismissed and and um, actually buried under the pressure of doing more, being more, having more, and sacrificing my physical body in the process of creating external results that I thought would be able to satiate the need of my internal turmoil, the the safety that I want wanted to establish with God. And so, you know, freedom for me then was a a response of going, I actually need to do less. Right. (laughs) Right. I need to encounter God's presence in resting. And gosh, when you're, when you're hyped up on adrenaline and cortisol, and when you fill every crevice of your day and you begin to rest, it is extremely dysregulating. (laughs) Yes. You know, you're like, I'm not doing enough and I'm wasting my life and Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm settling. They're going to tell me that I'm settling. A a friend of mine shared this and I was talking about this with Carrie the other day of that word settling. We, um, two weeks ago, I, it's a pattern in my story that summer comes with some pretty traumatic moments in the past, like over the course of the last decade. 
And summer was, um, summer was a time where I would, I would never rest with my children. I would never play. I would never, whatever. It was just work, 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 work because the fall's coming. And Mm. I was feeling that tension in my body a couple of weeks ago of going, I just feel so unsettled. And Mm. I also feel like I'm playing it safe in this group of people or even a past version of myself would look at me and call me weak or lazy for choosing to rest Mm -hmm. as much as I am. And um, a friend of mine encouraged me with these words of, but you are settling. You have settled into your body. You're settling into your role as a mother and as a Mm -hmm. wife. You are settling um, even in your nervous system. Um, Mm -hmm. a, A good friend of mine, I just had coffee with two weeks ago and she's like, when I encounter you now, I, she's like, you were amazing in, when I first met you four years ago, whatever. But she's like, you, you bring containment and calm, and it's so much easier to talk to you now. Oh. I don't know what it is about it. And I was like, that's because I'm settled. I'm not on edge thinking of 10 different things while I'm talking to you. I actually can be present because there's safety that has been reestablished in my body to where I can move with intention, honor the need of my body to move, to eat, to nourish, while also honoring my story and what set me up to be an overachieving, overworking, perfectionist people pleaser who didn't know how to rest or care for herself while she was doing her good duty for the kingdom of God. Right. Each of us have that root system of story beneath whatever behavior is on the surface. Yes. And this really speaks to this idea around like what you said, you know, our perception of what is safe and what is good, like good in the sense of this will protect me. Um, yeah. And that's really for many of us, when we talk about this bodily engagement you know, there's a little scientific word called neuroception. And this idea around neuroception is really the idea that says, my brain is always scanning the surface to find where I'm going to be safe. And that is really, but but the problem is, is with neuroception and this idea around safety, if we've been harmed, and if we have, you know, a perception that mom's not coming back or the expectation is to kill it for the kingdom and that's how people are going to love us and see us as worthy, then the neuroception in our brain is skewed by our experiences. And that means that we are going to constantly be con- like on a cycle of doing things that be- bring perceived safety when we're not actually safe in our bodies. And what God is wanting to do, and that, that is, you know, the scanning of if I hide and put these fig leaves on, then I'm going to be safe. And maybe that'll keep me from the condemnation that's going to come from Jesus. Right. And so we have been trained to do this by our ancestors and our brains, bodies, way of responding. And what God wants to invite us into is really this idea that neuroception is actually a good thing. We want we want to be scanning. If we're in a dark alley and there is danger coming, we want to be able to scan the surroundings and go, hey, this isn't a safe place to be. We need to get out of here. Absolutely. The problem is, is, is that the brain actually gets skewed by harm that's come to us or the experiences that we've had. And now what actually is a safe place like let's say church, for example, could be a safe place where we could learn about God mm-hmm. or whatever, but we've been hurt by church places. So now our neuroception is going, danger, danger, that place isn't good for you. So don't go there. And so we, we write off church completely, right? So I say all of this because where in your life, you know, uh, you know, Tori has shared with you around this idea around safety through working and doing, and I'm going to be, I'm going to be seen as good and that's bodily. So I will forsake rest just to get that Mm -hmm. sale. I I will Mm -hmm. forsake engagement with others just so that I can ruminate in my own, like stew in my own kind of in my mind, because if I can think about it enough, 
maybe I can control it and make a different outcome. That's definitely my go-to. So I'm going to stay away from people that are going to speak into my life. I'm going to get in my own head and I'm going to fix this problem myself. I'm on my own. There is no one I can trust. I can only trust me. And so I'm going to be in my own head, which produces, to be honest with you, depression. This this is an internal cycle. And so my neuroception has to be start to be changed and and we have to begin to understand how to do that like we have to change right. actually how our brain and our spirits see the world so that our bodies can begin to come into alignment with our mind and our spirit and begin to be at rest with itself just like what Tori said yes. to become calm and, and I want rest. to say this yes at rest and there's this idea, and, and I know, you know, we're talking about a lot, and we'll, we'll get to here in just a second, really, like, how, how do we start to reclaim? Because we do need some practical steps. But I just want to give a caveat here around this idea, and I see this culturally around our bodies, around self-expression. Like, I'm going to, I'm sitting with a, a client right now. She is leaving her husband because she mm. wants to go find herself. Her head, there's, you know, the marriage isn't great. It's not terrible either. It's just not, it, it's not, it's lost, it's lost its luster, you know, whatever. And she's like, yeah. I need to go find myself. I need to go and um, find who I truly am. And I need to do that away from him. So that, and, and my thing is, is like, we have so been fed a lie that if you are, if you find your self-expression in your body, your authentic self, like who you are really, then you're going to find happiness. But really that's not biblical. Biblical is self-sacrifice. It's not finding yourself through self-expression. Self-expression is a slippery slope to move us into places where we are led by our body's pleasure rather than by the spirit. So if my body feels it and wants it, then it must be good because, hey, God made a good body here. And so I want to do it. And this is what we get back to. We get back to the idea that says, if the body does not come under surrender of the God that created it, and I know we don't like it, we will then be led to our own pleasures and our own desires. And that's really what, you know, Paul is talking about in first Corinthians chapter, uh, chapter nine, verse 26, it says, therefore I don't run as like one who is aimingly, uh, aimlessly boxing or beating the air. Instead, I need to discipline my body. I need to bring Mm. it under the control of God so that when I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified. And what he's saying here Mm. is not that you forsake your body. It's that you bring it under the control of God, who's actually going to tend to it, who's going to speak goodness to it. He's going to help you to not move Mm. into places of of, hey, eat the fruit. It's going to, it looks good. You need it. It'll make you feel fulfilled, which leads you to temptation and death per James chapter three or chapter one. Uh, it, It leads you to that. What it's going to lead you to is life. But we have so become a culture of feed self expression over feed self sacrifice and the body is taking a toll because of it. Oh yeah, absolutely. And even the soundness of our minds, even the understanding of who we are, which is really Mm -hmm. what at the end of the day is the, is the quest. Mm -hmm. Um, And I mean, God really did design us to know him personally, and he's not holding out on us in a full revelation of who he has created us to be. Mm -hmm. And maturity in Christ isn't about doing more or discovering more of, you know, yourself. Otherwise, if it comes back to yourself it's just unstable ground. Like lo and behold, three months later, you feel different. Lo and behold, the, the, you know, chemicals in your brain are firing a little bit different and suddenly you want something else. I'm watching, I'm watching a a dear friend of mine, her brother absolutely deteriorate his life um, because pleasure is the one thing that he seeks and he is trapped in an absolute hell of a cage because he chased pleasure so far that it ended up taking his life. You see this in, um, I, I just read Proverbs 7 this morning where it's like, 
the the lure of even sexual or we could talk about so many things when it relates to the body um you know sex food, yeah, I mean, it's just desires. everything everything in life mm-hmm. we just mm-hmm. yeah desire mm-hmm. exists within our bodies this is how we live you can't exist as, aside from your human body right. on earth um but it's understanding more of who god is and how he crafted you to know him and also to make him known. And in the book, um, Jesus Manifesto, there's a really great quote that says, and this is speaking to the believer who's listening to this, that if Christ is in you, and we're talking about right now, all the emotions that we experience in our bodies, the desire within our bodies, the stories that our bodies have encountered, the yes. narrow pathways in our minds that have been engraved in our in our minds due to fear and encountering in our physical bodies what we were never designed to encounter sin destruction danger fear we weren't created for separation so our our good bodies have been designed to care for us and now what fear has woven in the neural pathways of our minds we have to receive the love of God afresh to rewrite those narrow pathways in our story. And that is by encountering the love of Jesus. And if Christ is in you, which is such a miraculous thing that he would choose to dwell, to live, and to embody your human flesh, like sit with that for a second. Mm. If Christ is in you, then the Christian life And your purpose, your identity, the fulfillment of your desire, um, you know, everything, uh, every single element of your human existence will not be satiated or satisfied by something external from you that you would strive for um, or striving to be something that you are not. It is instead becoming what you already are. Yes. It's being brought back to that garden place before you consumed something that separated you to be reunited. This is the invitation of Jesus. Eat this instead. Mm -hmm. You'll become something new in a lifelong transformation with me Mm -hmm. that will satiate your need to grasp for the wind Mm -hmm. of every single external thing that you think could satisfy, which is what's all through the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon's Mm -hmm. quest for everything. It's like grasping the wind to only come back to, oh, it's God's presence Mm -hmm. alive in me already. What would that look like? If Christ is in you, you're becoming more of who you already are. And every solution for your safety and fulfillment in life is in you in his right. presence, mm-hmm. then now engaging your body isn't so woo-woo by engaging your body and caring for your body, loving the good gift of your body. You are uh, have more free reign to encounter the goodness of God and his presence within your body. And it manifests through everything that you do to transform you to who you have always been, who you already are. The Um, image bearer of God. Of God. (laughs) That's what you get to do. And that's, and and here's what we want to leave you with, because we want to leave you with, you know, what we'll be doing on July 29th is taking this concept and making it very practical. Like where in your story have you ingested that has (laughs) moved you into places of being bound to the very thing that you quote unquote eat? And I mean that metaphorically or actually physically, but what have you quote unquote eaten that has kept you bound, satiating for a moment, but keeping you starving in the long run. Just as the woman mm. in the well, I have water that you will thirst. Oh, amen. Like they, there you will never have to thirst again. It, you know, on this side of heaven, you will need to drink water, but your internal soul will not be thirsty. The Bible says amen. in Romans chapter six, verse 12. So we don't let sin reign in our mortal bodies so that 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 you obey its desires and you do not offer any parts of it to sin as weapons for unrighteousness, but as those who are alive from the dead, offer yourself to God and all the parts Mm. of yourself to God as weapons for righteousness. And I think about this juxtaposition between letting sin reign 
letting the things that we ingest into our bodies, even the, the harm that has happened to us that we didn't do, we didn't cause that, but it has created effects in our bodies and we're living mm-hmm. out the effects of the harm that has happened to us. That sin, that place of harm that has, has been reigning in our mortal bodies, God is saying, if you want to reclaim the story in your body, you have to then submit your body unto me. You have to give it back to me. You have to give it back over to me. So instead of letting what happened to you reign, I need to reign. I need Mm. to reign in your mortal body. I need to be king. I need to be able to. And you do that by offering it. And it's simple as going, God, search me and know me and show me the anxious ways in me. Let me bring Mm. my body before you. You can even bring that as a physical, like here is my body. Show me, God, the ways in which it has been, it is being torn. It is being, um, Mm -hmm. I am trying to hide. I am trying to uh, mitigate pain. I want you to be able to come into this place and start asking me the questions, God, because I don't even know how I got here. And if you look back at Genesis, that's really the dialogue. They're just kind of like blaming each other. They don't really know. (laughs) They, They are just like, I don't know what happened. It's just like yes. the mother said it, everything went crazy. And did you eat of the tree? We did, but he made us do it. You know, it's this whole like mm-hmm. interaction between I can redeem this. There will be consequences this side of heaven. Yes, there are consequences to the things that either whether you've done it to you or, or it's been done to you, there are consequences in our mortal body. But God living in us begins to allow that redeemed story to be a weapon for righteousness. It's exactly what Paul was saying. As I bring this before the Lord, I get to testify on God's goodness. So number one, when we reclaim our story, we have to submit our body unto God. We cannot let what has been reigning our minds, our bodies, our spirits take uh, have control, but we've got so to bring good. it under the under God. And secondly, I truly believe this. We do this all the time at Freedom Academy. Uh, but we we need to bless our body. We need to yeah. bless it for where it has been good. Do I bless depression? No, but I bless the fact that my body has done its best to try to protect me. And now I have a choice. I don't have to live bound to an adaptive behavior where depression kept me protected from having to deal with the pain of my, my home. What Mm. I get to do is bring my depression underneath the authority of God. And although if I'm being honest, it's still there. It's not like it used to be, but now instead of it going raining in my body, I bring depression under the authority of God and God and I Amen. get to deal with that together. My food, I bring under the authority. Will I always struggle with wanting to eat pop tarts at, you know, midnight? Probably. Hello. Just said that out loud, but probably <laughs> want to do that. But I get to bring that under the, the authority of God. And I don't know if you're ever going to be fully healed from anxiety, depression, people pleasing, working from worth, all the things that we struggle Mm -hmm. with. But I am going to tell you, when you let God reign in your body and you let your body tell the truth of what's going on, I promise you, it gets easier. Absolutely does. Better. There mm-hmm. is now I'm able to use what reigned in my body for destruction and it's for unrighteousness. I actually get to use it as a weapon for righteousness because it's under mm. a good king. This is what Amen. this is what we're going to dive into. This is how we reclaim our story. This is how we reclaim it. And we're going to help yeah. you do that practically on July 29th. Any last thoughts, I, you know, you want to close with here? Because, you know, obviously, we no, it's so good. Forever. That was great. Yeah. <laughs> Period. <laughs> exclamation mark yeah. Yeah. the so, end and i mean we're going to continue this conversation over the next couple of weeks mm-hmm. talking about reclaiming the story in our calling and reclaiming the story in our family um because this although this is a piece and mm-hmm. a big a big piece our our human bodies um this love of god that is reigning in our stories and permeating through everything that we do has to overflow into into our actions and into our relationships so Mm -hmm. at first we encounter it in our good bodies and god alive in us but if it just stays in isolation where we have freedom in our bodies you know on our own Mm -hmm. that's not true freedom like loving god and loving others is an essential next step so that's what we're going to be talking about um in the coming 
uh, weeks. And you can, if you want to join us live for yeah. this day training on the 29th, please don't wait. Please follow the link in the show notes and register. Please bring a friend, yeah. um, you know, send a message to our team um, at hello at wearefreedommovement.org. If you have questions or if you have a group of people that would like to come mm -hmm. and be a part of it, if you have a business um, staff or if you have a church staff, we want to work with you to make it affordable and accessible for mm -hmm. you. Um, so, you know, please know we are friends in your corner yeah. that want to meet you where you are. And we want to see as many people living free and fully alive in everything that they do um, and say and in every relationship and in their own mm -hmm. physical bodies. And so come one, come all, Yeah. block off your schedule on the 29th and mm -hmm. join us. Yeah. yeah. I, and we'll end with just going good guys. Listen, this is not a theoretical conference. This is going to be practical tools for you truly to be able to sit down and go, okay, let me identify yep. a place in my story where I feel stuck and how to walk through that. That is why we created this truly. Here are some steps tangibly, practically on how to reclaim your story. Um, so because I good. know a lot yes. of it is theoretical. It's like, okay, I want a better story. Like, how do I start? And so we're going to know it needs to be action here. implementation yeah. and you need yeah. a guide and you yep. need a full day um, set aside in your schedule to do it. Not just five minutes after dinner and after the kids go to bed or whatever else is happening to try to process it. You have to prioritize healing in your schedule if it's going to mm -hmm. happen. Um, and so, you know, Amen. if you want it, then you'll make a way to be there. And if not here, some of the other resources that we have in Freedom Movement are great places to start, but this is going to be a, a really perfect entry point for any of those other things. So Yeah, so good. Well, We're Tori, excited. it was fun to, to start our little series together. We can talk for hours and hours and honestly did talk for over an hour because we're we not did. shocked. Yeah. <laughs> So thanks guys for hanging in there. We will see you guys next week where we talk about reclaiming the story in your calling. But for now, go and honor your body by just blessing it. Just taking a minute, bless your legs, bless your heart, bless your hands, bless those amazing thighs, bless your tummy, bless your yeah. feet, bless your face because your face is the beholder of the glory of God. And may you always Amen. find that in the honest places of your heart is where Jesus is found. We'll see you next week.